question, and uh, I will yield back whatever time I have remaining. Senator Whitehouse, I'm grateful for your comments and the work you're doing with Senator Cornyn. I think there will be a lot of rich um, contributions from the witnesses uh, in hopes that we uh, can work with you two uh, to make that bill uh, something that uh, it goes a long way into covering what a lot of our witnesses are saying is urgently needed. So we appreciate Senator Whitehouse's leadership. I want to uh, uh, jump in. If there's no other Democrats online, none, then I will just jump in uh, myself. I want to just first jump uh, to Ms. Morgan. There was a little bit of um, uh, uh, a shadow cast on, I think, the, the, the work that CAHOOTS does and some of the testimony. And I'm wondering, could you just give us a characterization? How many incidents does CAHOOTS respond to each year? And in how many of them do responders call police for backup? And can you characterize those moments when, um, I think it was represented uh, by another witness that one out of every 60 or so times you guys call for backup. Could you give some light on that, uh, that data point, and also talk to us a little bit about what is it, when, what happens when they call for police? Absolutely. So the total amount of calls we were dispatched to in 2019, which is our most recent data, um, wound up to be about 17% of the calls or just over 17,000, 17,700. On those calls, we requested police backup about 1.5 almost percent of the time. Uh, it was 311 out of that 17,700. And of those calls that we did call for backup, the 311, we called for code three cover, which is lights and sirens, about five percent of the time, so it is could very. You be, could you be more explicit? Code three coverage. Just be explain what that means. Yeah. Code three coverage means that in that exact moment, we believe there's an imminent threat to someone, ourselves, the client, a, a stander by, that we're going to need a police response for immediately. So part of what makes this program work is that we have that access by carrying the police radios. If a situation either escalates or is a situation that came to us but is appropriate for a law enforcement response we can request them and they can come quickly what might have us determine that we need a law enforcement response is typically going to be safety related it's going to be we are a consent-based program because we don't have the authority of law enforcement to take anybody's rights away so people can choose to engage with us or not if they choose not to but are not behaving in a safe way we can't just let them be unsafe and that is where we might end up um, bringing in law enforcement. Is so, that so it's safe to say it's a, it's a, a fraction of the time, 1.7% you call for police, and a fraction of that is because of imminent harm or danger to other, other people. Correct. Got it. Uh, um, can I uh, just, I want to move on for you in the, in the limited time that I have. Um, uh, can I, uh, 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 Mr. Mardone, you, you again, I just find your perspective on this so valuable about the larger crisis in America that we are not doing. We do not have a mental health care system that in any way meets uh, um, uh, the challenges we have. And, and it is a crisis of empathy. It's a crisis of compassion. It's a poverty, really, of, of our ability to love one another in a, in a substantive way and protect ourselves. Clearly, our lack of doing it isn't just a harm to the mental health uh, uh, the person struggling with mental health, it's a, it's a harm to all of us. It's a self-inflicted wound. So can I just, just ask you, I'm just trying to figure out ways to build upon your testimony in terms of really good guidance about what we should be doing. So when you work with states and local governments, what resources are, are there that they most frequently request? Like what, what are these professionals that are supposed to keep us safe um, uh, saying to you that they most need? I think, thank you, Senator, for the question. You know, in, in the crisis space, you know, I think, and you heard us from the CAHOOTS um, uh, program, you know, when, when calls are diverted to crisis centers, you know, 80 or 90% of those calls can be diverted on the phone from the start. And then those that can't be diverted often then go to a mobile response program like CAHOOTS or in many different states have different types of mobile response programs. And then when mobile response programs engage a person, they then can divert a person from more restrictive settings like law enforcement or emergency departments. They can divert people to linkages with outpatient services and things like that. 
Um, and what, what we hear in the crisis space is, yeah, we may have a program in Eugene, or we may have a program in, you know, some state that's, you know, there's one in a county for a million people, you know? And the problem is there's not enough capacity, right? So when we think about the capacity for call centers, you know, we have the new 988 national hotline that's gonna be stood up. We need to make sure that there's enough capacity in those systems to sufficiently handle calls that may be, um, instead of going to 911, go to 988, or maybe triaged from 911 to 988. And we need enough resources so that we could stand up a sufficient mobile capacity um, so that, you know, w police can respond right away, right? Mobile crisis teams, if they can't respond in a very short period of time, it's going to just default again to the police response. So mobile response programs need to have that capacity. And then there needs to be sort of that next step beyond mobile, right? There needs to be crisis stabilization programs or drop-offs or, or a, a mental health program that can receive that, that crisis and then begin to serve that person all that trying to divert a person back upstream and away from the law enforcement system. So I'm gonna give you just cogent quickly as you can because you're gonna be asked this in writing by Senator Whitehouse. You are now the better looking, more haired Senator from New Jersey. You, three things that you would wanna get into the bill. Give it to me real quick, three things. Um, I think we need um, a, a additional uh, federal, federal Medi uh, Medicaid dollars um, to match um, uh, state dollars so that we can provide enhanced capacity to provide these services out there. There's some of that. Um, I think we need uh, more linkages to upstream services. Some of that is uh, state funding, but a lot of it, again, is, is Medicaid matching dollars. Some of it also, frankly, is rapid rehousing uh, access, access to housing, right? Many of these folks are homeless, right? We need rapid linkages to housing situations for folks as well, because so much of this is, is, tied, to, is tied to that, you know. Yeah, that's my experience as well. That's really, uh, really, really insightful. Um, I'd like to jump to um, Major Bartness, and again, thank you for your incredible service and leadership. Um, so building on some of the things we've asked before with CAHOOTS, um, tell me this, does responding to calls involving people in crisis or with mental illness divert law enforcement resources? In other words, is this crisis a drain on your ability to focus your department on other areas where you could help better keep people safe? Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, it absolutely is. Uh, as I indicated in my testimony, and Mr. Uh, Martona, I, I believe also indicated the very significant percentage of 911 calls coming into law enforcement, um, somewhere around uh, 10%, um, is substantial. And that is time spent away uh, from addressing more traditional uh, matters related to public disorder, crime, and safety. And these kinds of calls to be handled properly uh, are not uh, disposed of quickly. Police officers, we're, and, and we're very intentional about this, um, in educating our officers to spend time with consumers on these calls, uh, because we don't want to have to continually come back. We want to do our very best to link them through uh, to um, community-based services. And so we connect them with the crisis hotline, uh, at our uh, crisis response center. And we really endeavor um, to get these folks the treatment that they need. The reality is, as Mr. Marton has stated, um, the services are not there uh, to meet the demands of the population. I, I really appreciate that. I wanna jump to Ms. Myrick really quick. One thing we haven't talked too much about is peer support, peer to peer, and how powerful that could be. Could you just, just, just give me really quickly, why do you think peer support is so important in behavioral health care and, and generally what function does it serve? Um, sure, thank you for the question. And um, uh, peer support um, is essential is all I can say. Um, you know, the first time I met a peer who looked like me, it was the first time I thought, okay, wow, I can really get better. Somebody who'd been through what I had been through. Um, and, you know, evidence has shown, you know, with peers who have training, who are, who are certified and have training can really support people, especially in crisis, to um, help identify kind of what is going on. They can slow things down. We've heard from other people uh, giving testimony about um, how it's important to slow things down in order for people to make their needs known, especially when they're in crisis, and then help um, get uh, connected to the resources that they need. Peer supports are trained, peer supporters are trained to do that, and they use also other evidence-based um, 
uh, tools and mechanisms to do so. One of the things that I think is critically important are things like wellness and recovery action plans, which can help people to understand when are they doing well and when are things starting to break down and um, in order to uh, prevent a crisis and then develop a plan for what happens if they do enter crisis and post-crisis. The legal means to do that is through psychiatric advanced directives, which peers can also help people do. Um, and I also think that uh, peers who are families to support other families and other parents is also another critically important step. So families and parents um, have a better kind of understanding of how to support their loved one pre, post, and during crisis. So, um, you know, having um, peers on mobile crisis teams, um, being able to meet people where they are, possibly support them in the field, having them as part of the 988 um, workforce response also is a, a 988 is the number people can uh, call when they um, need um, uh, support, where they can take the time on the call to um, help with some of the triage and work with people um, immediately is another way that peer supporters can be used. And lastly, we've heard people need places to go. It might be fine that you can get the crisis team there, um, but what about where the people go if they need someplace safe to go but may not need hospitalization? Peer support is totally underutilized, totally underfunded, and if there were more peer support respites um, where people can go um, and have a peer support 24-7 um, and get that space away from possible crisis that um, is contributing to their mental health distress is critically important and needs to be part of the um, uh, mental health uh, crisis response ecosystem. That, that is excellent. And it also resonates some with the point from Mr. Martone about the, the power of supportive housing with people that are there. I'm, I'm uh, Senator Cotton, who had to uh, attend to business on the floor of the United States Senate, is back. We're going to, just so folks know, we're going to, uh, he's going to give his questioning. Then we're going to go to um, uh, Senator uh, Padilla. And then we, I think we're going to uh, uh, end at that point and wrap the hearing. So I appreciate the patience of the witnesses. And I'm honored to turn over to my ranking member, Senator Cotton.